So without further ado, um, Demetris, are you on? <laughs> I am. I am. Yeah. Hello, yes, everyone. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I saw you visually, but I hadn't actually seen your face yet. So um, I'm really, really excited to introduce uh, Demetris Cheatham, who uh, is the Senior uh, Director at Diversity, Inclusion, and Belonging Strategy at GitHub. And Demetris leads the Diversity and Inclusion Strategies, and she focuses on four pillars, which are people and HR, platform, philanthropy, P, oh, I can't read today, sorry, philanthropy and policy. And beyond strategy development, she, um, she also spends time working with external, partner, external partners to advance diversity and inclusion within open source ecosystems. And that's something that we here at the OSPO and at UCSC and the CROSS are all really excited about working with her a little bit moving forward uh, uh, in uh, the next few years. So um, now in 2021, she, she launched the GitHub All In Open Source Community open source community, which is organizing wide reaching listening tour with contributors, maintainers and leaders throughout the open source community with aims of better understanding and experience the challenges of priorities ahead for developers. So it's a really exciting program. I hope she's gonna talk about that a bit. And if you don't, if she doesn't have a chance to go too much into it, it's really exciting. There's a lot of information about um, all in out there. Uh, before GitHub, Demetrius was a global diversity and inclusion lead for Red Hat where she was responsible for implementing diversity and inclusion strategies for the company and its 15,000 plus employees. Um, she has her BS in computer science uh, with honors from North Carolina A&T State University and a JD and MBA from the University of Maryland Francis King Carey School of Law and the University of Maryland Robert F. Smith School of Business respectively. So without further ado, I will turn it over to Demetrius. Hi. <laughs> Hi, thanks Stephanie so much. And I'm actually gonna talk about all the things that you just briefly mentioned hey. in our bio. I am going to... I'm gonna, I'm gonna stand in front of you. All right. Hi. I'm gonna also stand and get you pinned real quick so everybody sees you. All right. No, we're ready to go. Yeah, hold on one second. Sorry, this is a little, this using this is a little new to me. And, uh, <clears throat> and it's telling me I need to quit and reopen. Let me come right back, Stephanie. Okay, okay. okay. Oh, God, yeah. Oh, well, then I won't do this right now. <laughs> uh, well, it's probably a new laptop. Yeah. <laughs> speaker. Okay, I'll wait till she comes back up. Okay, well, while we're waiting for Demetrius to come back. Uh, so tonight we'll be, today we'll have, uh, I'll go over the agenda really quick. Today we're going to have Demetrius, then we'll follow by Carson, who is also going to be remote. And then we'll have a coffee break. And then um, the uh, next person is uh, the panel. That's your panel. Mm -hmm. I don't have it in front of me, so uh, that'll be the panel with um, with Emily as well as oh, there you are, she's back. And then of course for everyone there's, who's here, we get to have our barbecue at the end of the day, which I guess is the most important. All right, Demetrius, are you on? I am. I am. Are okay, you cool. able to hear me? Okay. Yeah, and we can see your screen. Robert. Great. So. Awesome. All right. So I am so delighted to be here with all of you today. I'm going to talk about two of my absolute favorite things. That's diversity and inclusion and open source. And I promise you, I'm not just saying that because it's literally my job and what I do here at GitHub every day. So speaking of my job, as Stephanie mentioned, I'm their senior director for diversity and inclusion strategy at GitHub. And I have to tell you, I remember when I was interviewing or going through the interview process for my job. I was meeting with Erica Brescia, and she was telling me how GitHub took a very holistic approach to diversity and inclusion. Um, it was aligned across their people, um, you know, processes, which is typically HR, what you traditionally see, but it also um, aligns its strategy across its platform, as well as its philanthropy efforts and its policy efforts. And so as she was telling me this, she asked me that all important question, right? That question we all know is gonna come, but it still manages to catch us off guard during an interview. She said, Demetrius, why do you want to join GitHub? And I was sitting there thinking that at the time, which was almost two years ago, it was a platform of 50 million developers. Now we're at about 88 million and counting every single day. But I remember kind of humbly, I said, Erica, 
I want to join GitHub because I want to open source diversity and inclusion. And I have to say that it was a pretty good answer because I got the job and I'm here almost two years later. So when I started, Erica said, okay, Demetrius, you're hired. Now go open source diversity and inclusion. And I was like, uh, what does that mean? So I started doing what I love to do, which is talking to as many people as I can to figure out what exactly would it look like for us to open source diversity and inclusion. So amongst the hundreds of conversations that I had with people all across the open source ecosystem, there were a few things that started to emerge. The first thing that I pretty much heard from everyone is that inclusion happens at the community level. You see, when people come into open source, especially new contributors, those first one or two interactions that they have within a community, it really sets the tone for their future in open source. If they have some amazing experiences, they're welcome, they feel like they belong, they're able to contribute meaningfully, they typically will say, open source, I love this, these are my people, and they're here to stay for many, many years. But if they come in and they have negative interactions, they're hit with microaggressions, they feel like they're being ignored, no one is paying attention to them, they're ignoring their pull requests, usually they will look around, say, I like this place, but these are not my people, and they usually leave, oftentimes for good. So if inclusion is happening at the community level, the second thing that we heard was that maintainers or community leaders they are the ones that really set the tone for inclusion. Think about it like this. So say for instance, you're working in a corporation or any organization for that matter, and that company puts out these you know, company-wide initiatives, mandatory training on unconscious bias, um, how to have inclusive communications, all of those things there. Everyone in the company takes them. But when you go back into your team, it's those day-to-day -day interactions that really make you feel welcome or not feel welcome. That's where the belonging happens. And so that culture, those day-to-day -day interactions, you're the manager of that team. They're the ones that really sets that tone. And so what we heard was that maintainers and community leaders, they act like those managers within their communities. So they drive that culture of inclusion. But one thing that I know when I talk to all the managers and community leaders, they said we are not short on resources at all. We have podcasts, we have checklists, there's articles, there's conferences, education, training, there's tons of resources out there that's telling us how to create this culture of inclusion in our community. So I said, well, if resources aren't an issue, what is the issue? And that's where you started to see some differentiation within the conversations. So maintainers of small communities or those communities that are less resourced, they said, yes, we have all those resources, the checklists and all those things. And we are actually talking to our community members almost on a daily basis. I can see just about everybody in our community. However, we have some competing things that are not necessarily more important, but we have to focus on them at this time. That means that they are trying to get as many contributors to their community as possible at the beginning. As maintainer said, they're trying to get hands on the keyboard. They're trying to get contributors from wherever they can, whoever they are. And so they don't have the time and the bandwidth to focus on creating that culture of inclusion within that community because they have that competing interest of trying to just get new contributors there to contribute. So that's what the maintainers of the small community said. So I said, let me talk to maintainers of larger communities or more well-resourced communities. And what they said was, Demetrius, we have the resources. We have the time to do it. We actually have the bandwidth, but there's this definite tipping point when your community becomes too large. You have too many contributors or, or people in your community for you to easily influence the culture. 
So you see, at the time that you have the most time to do it is when you've lost the ability to do it. You actually need to start and when you first create your community, but that's when you have the least amount of time to do it. And so with those kind of, you know, tension points there, we decided that we wanted to really address those things because what we heard from maintainers and community leaders of small and large communities, they said, Demetrius, we can build the most inclusive communities ever but there's still some significant barriers to entry for those without access, especially those from under-resourced or historically excluded and marginalized communities. You see, we can't fall into that old adage that if we build it, they will come. If that gate is so high that people can't get into that community or even access them, what are we really doing here? And so that's what we started out with to address with the creation of All In, an open source community meant to facilitate collaboration, transparency across the industry so that we all can come together and bring our resources together. And we're looking at it from the lens of access, community, equity, and data. So during the first year of All In, which we launched at last year, we had three goals. The first was to create and launch an open source diversity, equity, and inclusion survey. The second was to conduct a maintainer's listening tour. And the third was to kick off and complete a 12-month pilot focused on students and maintainers. So let's talk about this survey. So we partner with the Linux Foundation because GitHub is an important partner and has an important role in the open source ecosystem, but we're not the only ones in the ecosystem. So we wanted to partner with an organization that actually has um, access to everyone. And so we were able to survey over 7,000 open source contributors and those that are in the ecosystem. For you amazing researchers out there, I invite you to go to our website, allinopensource.com. It is oh, org. It is 64 pages of you know data, as well as solutions that we would love for you to take a look at and actually use in the development of your work and your research. So there were some interesting findings about the survey, and I wanted to share a few with you. So the first thing was. 82% of survey respondents said that they felt welcome in open source. This was a pleasant surprise and an amazing, amazing accomplishment. I can tell you there are many organizations, universities, companies alike, that they get 82% I feel welcome on their annual engagement surveys. There would be parties thrown. Like that is a big feat that many, many people are trying to accomplish. There would be confetti and champagne bottles popping and all of those things. But guess what? That's not the work of diversity and inclusion. We wanna focus on the 18% or the one in almost five of survey respondents that do not feel welcome in open source, that could not agree with the statement. What are their experiences? What are their stories? What is it that they are facing in the challenges? Because I can guarantee you that whatever they're experiencing is probably what's keeping millions of others from even attempting to enter into the open source industry. So what are the 25% of persons with disability? What are they facing? The 26% of those in open source that identify in women as women, 29%, that's almost a third of people of color in the United States and North America said that they do not feel welcome in open source. And a staggering 38% of people who are non-binary, third gender, they do not feel welcome in open source. That's the work that needs to be done. So while we acknowledge the 82%, we have to lean in to that 18%. So when we comb through the 
thousands and thousands of comments. We actually had the survey translated in 10 different languages as well as available for 10 different languages. So we got comments from all over the world. No matter where they are, what languages they spoke, there were a few themes that came out. People said that when they did not have the technical skills and knowledge to contribute to a community, they were made to feel inferior. They said that they were constantly getting a lack of response and rejections to contributions. Let me tell you, if you are a maintainer and a community leader and you're just not responding to your contributors, they are made to feel inferior and like they do not belong. And I know that's not the intent. What we heard was a specific comment that just shook me to my core. They said that in most communities I participate in, if I am white, if I'm not white, if I'm not male, if I'm not wealthy, if I'm not university educated, they don't want me in their community. And I know that's not what we do in open source. They also said that their voice isn't heard or their contributions aren't welcome. Maintainers, they are feeling ignored. And then microaggressions and stereotypes in written and spoken language, that continues to be an issue, especially culturally. There is so much work to be done and we can't blame it all on unconscious bias. Some of this bias is conscious and we need to make sure that we address this. We need to get to the place where inclusion is not the exception, it's the norm. We have to get to a point where we have amazing documentation across every community so that when you come in, they know exactly how they can contribute no matter their experience level. We have to have amazing community hospitality like the open source community in which when you come into that community, you immediately receive a welcome message that says, hello, we are glad you're here. We see you. Your voice is so important to us and we need your contributions. I have to put in a shameless plug that that automatic message is done through GitHub Actions. But we also have to get to the point where accessibility audits are running is the norm, that we are really stamping out non-inclusive language where sign language and ASL interpretation like we have at this amazing co this conference, the closed captioning, that's a norm across all industry events and even community meetings. Those are some of the things that we can do to really start fostering this culture of inclusion. So after the survey, the next thing we did, well, actually we were doing it simultaneously, was conducted a maintainer's listening tour. As many of you researchers that are in the audience, sometimes your data might not be giving you the complete picture and you need that sentiment as well. It was important for us to listen to those stakeholders that we've learned are responsible largely for driving the culture of inclusion in their communities. So over a four month period, we conducted in-person and virtual focus groups. We had individual interviews and we created a form for online feedback so that anyone that could not get to a focus group or individual interview, they were able to complete an asynchronous form to still provide us with information. And so what we're going to do with the, found, the findings, from the, um, findings from that maintainers listening tour, we're going to launch all in for maintainers and we're launching that starting next month and so we wanted to live into our mantra and our motto that we have at github at github we say we don't create inclusion for our employees we create it with them so we wanted to take that same approach into this maintainers listening tour we did not want to create solutions for maintainers we wanted to create it with them and so now we're gonna use the findings from that maintainers listening tour to do that. But what we did do last year, and we're just now completing it, is we launched that 12 month pilot for students. And I have to tell you, these are some amazing students. I can't wait to tell you a little bit more about them in a little bit. But we took students from minority serving institutions here in the United States, and we put them through a year long program. 
during the first few months or our North American summer, they received open source education. It was open source one-on-one, which was generously donated by the Linux Foundation. And they also took professional development and career education. Then the second semester, we partnered with Major League Hacking and the students got a 12 week open source technical project. Again, they received mentoring and career development during that second semester. Because what we understood about the mentoring and the, and the career development, you can give people all of the technical skills in the world, but the tech industry, we're a little bit different. We wanted them to know all the things that we wish we had known when we started in the tech industry. How do you make sure that you are getting valuable feedback? How to give valuable feedback? How to talk about your work and the value you're bringing? Also, how to deal when you are faced with microaggressions, not if. What do you do when you're the only person that looks like you on a team? We wanted to make sure that the students were prepared for that as well. Now, the whole goal of the open source education, professional development, and the 12-week open source project was to prepare these students to hopefully compete and secure an internship with one of our corporate partners. And they were doing that during the summer. They had to interview for them. So let's talk about the students that we went to, um, that we actually recruited. The first thing I have to say is the minority serving institutions that we chose and selected to participate in the program, those are schools that are traditionally overlooked. There's no companies really going on these campuses because they're very small universities. We have some schools that have as few as 15 students that are computer science majors across all four years. So quite honestly, the ROI isn't there to send a major recruiting team. We also were very thoughtful about the students that were um, selected to participate in the, um, in the pilot. We know that even if you're within the top 10% of those smaller schools, you still probably will find your way to success in a career path. But we know that GPA is an indicator of success, but it's not the only indicator of success. We have students in our program who are commuting over two hours each way to school every day because they can't afford to live on campus. They are full-time caregivers, especially during the pandemic. And even some of them are full-time parents. They're working full-time and part-time jobs to afford to stay for school. We have several of them that are not only military veterans, but we have some that are active duty military. Every single weekend, they are actually reporting to duty so that they can afford to go to college. We have full-time at student athletes that they're in college because they have to play sports in order to keep their sponsorship. So they're not able to actually have a summer internship because they're training during the summer. All of these are hardworking, dedicated students, but they're dealing with life. And so while when I was in the computer science um, major and I was majoring there in school, I could be in the computer lab all night, you know, programming on weekends after games and all of those things right there. That was my privilege. But these students don't have that same privilege, but that doesn't mean they don't deserve an opportunity. So we did not do an application. We did not do interviews. We did not look at GPAs. What we did was partner with the professors and the chairs of the computer science departments at these schools. And we said, look out into your classrooms and tell us who deserves this opportunity. Who's hard work and dedicated. They just need a shot. They need that door just cracked open just a little bit so that once they go through it, we know that they are likely going to have success. And that's what we did. And so here are the founding partners from the first year, the universities, the companies, the other open source organizations who all said we are all in with these students. We are willing to go to bat for them and do what it takes for them to succeed. We're going to open source this thing. I can tell you when I first started and started thinking of this concept, I heard that people and companies who are, more, that are usually competitors, 
will never agree to work together on talent. We proved them wrong. You had GitHub, Intel, Cisco, Red Hat, Microsoft, Fidelity. They came in and said, we're willing to explore a different model in service of creating a more diverse and equitable and inclusive future in open source. And so when you have everyone working together, when you're open source and diversity and inclusion, this is what it looks like from a founding partner standpoint. And this is what it looks like for the next generation of leaders in open source standpoints. All of these students right here are the ones that completed that entire program that I told you about, all 170 plus hours in addition to their schoolwork and all of those other things you heard about. None of these students had internships prior to All In. None of them had heard of open source after they put in the work and they actually interviewed and competed for those open um, internship opportunities this past summer. 100% of these students got internship offers this past summer and successfully completed them. And not only that, I'm getting emails every day and I'm seeing LinkedIn posts just about you know once a week. These students are now gone from not having too many career prospects in tech to now they are getting invited back to come back for their internships next summer. I have some of these students who were juniors in this program and now they're seniors, they have their full-time offers in hand. And so that's what it looks like. This is the next generation when we all work together. So what do I need from all of you? The number one thing that I want you to take away from this entire presentation is that All In is not a program. It's not a set of programs. It's a community. And as a community, we need people. We need all of you. As I said about maintainers of new communities earlier on, we need hands on the keyboard now. We need your energy. We need your passion. We need your thought leadership. Everything that you can bring to making a more diverse and equitable open source, we need it in this community. So how do you participate? Join the community. Go to allinopensource.org and sign up and say that you're willing to partner with us. If you are a community or a company or even a foundation who actually wants to provide opportunities for these students, please let us know. We are scaling this program. Last year, we started with a pilot of 30 students. This year, we're increasing it by 10x to 300 students. And, when it th and within three years, we have a goal of upskilling and providing opportunities for 5,000 students. And we also need your contributions. We are open sourcing this, not only from a thought leadership perspective, but also from a funding perspective. And so I want to just thank the many foundations who've already contributed to All In, and I look forward to partnering with all of you even more. So you have the mission, you have the vision, you have the charge, ways that you can contribute. So let's open source diversity and inclusion, everyone. Thank you. And I would love to take any questions. Thank you, Demetrius, this is great. Um, I, we have a couple things on the chat and I wasn't able to totally follow because I was running back and forth, but um, if anybody is wants, in, in this audience wants to, um, ask the question. Um, we also have, we also have, I want to just uh, remind everyone there's a Slack channel for continued conversation, um, as well as we have a shared Google Doc that's linked. If you go to the, um, the agenda page and you could, it'll, there's one for the, the all day today, and you'd be able to ask questions. And if Demetrius, if you could check back on that and see if you answer questions as well, or we could have a discussion, a live discussion, either on the Slack or on the um, Google. Yeah. And very. Yes. Questions? Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what I uh, So just announce yourself who you are. Uh, Fareed, I have two questions. Feel free to answer which, whichever. Um, I'm curious how this program is different from Summer of Code. And then the other one is your thoughts on open source has become synonymous, especially with your talk with community. Is there a space for what about people that just want to release their code open source, but not necessarily create a community? Um, what's a path forward for that rather than, yeah. 
Yeah, so I heard the first question clearly. I'm going to address that one and then I'm going to come back to you to um, clarify the second one for me, if that's okay. So the first one was, how is this different from Summer of Code? One of the things that we're doing that's a little bit different from Summer of Code is that we're actually intentionally focused on populations that are often overlooked. We're actually going to the students and meeting them where they are versus setting up a program and asking them to come to us. So we're kind of leaning in a little bit more. And we're also providing what I call, you know, wraparound support for these students. Um, that's where the phrase all land came from. So we have weekly, I mean, monthly meetings with the university partners, meeting their chairs and their um, professors. We also have weekly meetings with the, I mean, monthly meetings with the corporations as well. And we meet weekly with the students. So we're hearing from all of them and we're in constant communication with them. So that if there's a student that might be falling behind in school, the corporations are stepping in, especially those that they're working in and saying, let's provide mentoring support, what's in the way of that student and vice versa. During the summer internship, if a student was, you know, like faltering on something, they would pick up the phone and call me and we just have this wraparound support there. We didn't drop anyone from the program. We were actually leaning in and just really understanding. And so not saying this is about summer of code, just differentiating from most programs, is that oftentimes they'll give you these experiences is for you to put on your resume and they send you on your way. We're actually looking at the entire pipeline to understand where students may fall off and we're handing them from place to place so that ultimately they get whatever career opportunity that they're really trying to get, whether they want to work for a company, if they want to be an entrepreneur, we're looking at getting mentors for them, helping them on a path, path to maintainership. We're looking at if they want to work for nonprofit, social sector organizations. So I say that's kind of what the differentiating factor is, is that we're working more with wraparound support. Now, what would be ideal, and we're getting to that, we just finished a pilot, we want organizations like Summer of Code to partner with us in All In, because that's an option for students to go as well if they want to get more of that technical support directly in with those um, you know, with something like Summer of Code. So we are actually bringing everybody together versus setting up something separate. We're trying to figure out all these different career avenues for them or pathways. So if you could clarify your second question for me. Is there a path forward or what's your thoughts on, for GitHub for open source projects, not a, open source code where the goal isn't necessarily a community? But perhaps some of the respondents on the survey landed to an open source project, but the author just wanted to make the code freely available and not necessarily make it a, a, a community. There seems to be a miss, you know, uh, yeah, mismatch there. Yeah, so I, I will be the first to admit that would be more of a question for our, you know, developer team and product team. So if I may take, if you can actually email me and my email address and I give it freely, Demetrius1111, Demetrius11 at github.com. If you could send that to me, I'd be happy to help facilitate kind of that conversation so that I can make sure I'm getting it. But I don't want to get up here and give a technical answer of something in my product team because I do that. I used to do that quite often. They were like, yeah, we had it on product roadmap. So if we can um, take that offline, I greatly appreciate it. Uh, thanks for the great talk, Demetrius. Uh, so I'm Alisa Grover, uh, uh, community organizer in the Bay Area. Uh, and uh, so I did uh, several conferences uh, here for 10 years. And uh, what we found is, so I'm, I'm curious about the number, you know, 82% feel welcome, 18% feel not welcome. I think the number is, uh, there is an elephant in the room. There are people who are not in the survey, who are not even an open source yet and the reason they're not there that we didn't reach out to them right so what we've done at the meetups and conferences we reached out to local community colleges mm -hmm. right and so there is a lot of underrepresented students in in community colleges also in high schools right and so we kind of invite them all as volunteers to help so we had you know several dozen people who got very excited so i wonder how does your program overlap with the need to reach out to students who are not aware of this yet? Maybe they're programming in school, taking classes. How do you make 
yourself visible in this program as a resource to community colleges and uh, high school seniors, uh, students like that? Yeah, so we par we piloted this past year with six schools, most of them that, well, all of them didn't have open source, they weren't even aware of open source, you know, some of the professors were, but none of the students. And so we started out small so that we could understand the pain points and ways that we can lean in. So this year we're expanding it and I almost call it an expanded pilot instead of an official launch, but we're launching, we're actually um, increasing it to 25 schools, which includes community colleges. And to that point that you just mentioned, we are constantly getting data and surveying the students that are coming in contact with our program so that we can do that very thing that you're talking about. And so that was something that we actually think about a lot at GitHub is that when we're reaching out to the open source community, we're not getting the voice of those that are not in the open source community. And that's why my program is really focused on the places where no one else goes, where there's no one that has a presence up there their voice isn't being brought to the table and they, they aren't being heard. And so I have an, like a very long report and I'm trying not to put out another PDF report that nobody might not read, um, but we're trying to figure out how to bring all those findings to the light. And so we have some amazing things. And so this year, I'm really looking forward to the partnerships with the community colleges that we're having in the program so that we can hear from them as well. So we're getting it kind of in that ship to learn versus in the survey piece of it. Great, thank you. All right, oh, Oscar, okay, we have, we have for one more question. Again, if we don't get to everything, uh, Demetri just said she's gonna be answering on Slack as well. So just go on to the Slack channel. Well, again, one so more question. My question is about bring, bridging the gap and just to kind of explain it. So I think there are two groups of people, one that have been excluded in the past. Uh, for instance, I always, always been a foreigner, so I know what is it like to be, you know, standing out. And I think those people tend to be naturally inclusive. And then you have the people who don't, who don't have that experience of being uh, excluded. And so for them, all the things you said might be either conceptual or even like they might not relate to it. So how do you bridge that gap? How do you actually address the people who don't even know what this is like to be excluded? Yeah, I think actually to, like, I think that everyone has been excluded in some form or fashion or another. They just might not realize it, right? Um, you know, case in point, and I'll give you this very uh, personal example for me. I grew up in a town, very small town, poor town in, in Eastern North Carolina. And I didn't go to school with anybody, high school and elementary school that didn't look like me. Like we were an all black community. And I thought that was the norm. Now, looking back to how I grew up, I realized that the town was just segregated. Everybody that was black lived on this side of the railroad tracks and everybody that was white lived on this side of the railroad tracks. It was the most amazing thing ever looking back on it. And so I just had the opportunity to speak at the um, Sean Zuckerberg initiative last week. And I was talking to a group of people exactly like um, what you're describing. They were from another country and they said, we've never experienced exclusion. And so when I talked to them, about what their experiences were and what some of the findings that I was getting from others in their countries that they didn't even know about, they were like, oh my goodness, I had no idea. So one of the things about diversity and inclusion, which is what makes it kind of this um, nebulous thing that people can't really grasp, is that it means something different to everyone, depending on where you are. The interesting part about it is we had 15% um, of white men that said that responded to the survey that said that they didn't feel welcome in open source. And nobody talks about white men that don't feel welcome in open source. Believe me, I've been thinking about this a lot. But we and but the thing that really you know bothered me about that statistic, which was higher than I would have thought, is that typically those that are responding, white men that are responding to the survey, they're our allies. So if we're ostracizing them and making them feel excluded. We can't afford to have anybody that's championing this work leaving or not feeling welcome in open source. And so I think it's to the point that you just made is making sure that we're talking to as many people as possible, localizing the experiences of inclusion, because what inclusion looks like in North America is different in India, is different in Japan, is different in J J um, New Zealand, is differently in Latin America. And then if you break Latin America up, 
So what I'm trying to do is cast as wide of a net as possible. I will admit All In as it is right now is a very US centric program. And that's something that we have to address as a global platform. That's why we're working on and kind of fine tuning the model this year for the the US or North America. And then we are expanding globally out there. So, I mean, after that. So I would just say, we just have to make sure that we're localizing our strategy, localizing our program. So it resonates to people in the way in which it aligns to their experiences. Thank you. So, sorry, no more, we don't have time for any more questions live at least, but like I said, Beatrice was uh, gonna be on the Slack channel. And we also, like I said, had the Google doc, but if people can use one or the other, that that's fine. Um, but just, uh, yeah, feel free to ask questions and keep this uh, conversation going. And I just really wanna thank Beatrice and uh, I'm looking forward to working and hearing more about All In and hopefully uh, being able to collaborate more because uh, it was it's definitely an exciting. Time. So thank you very much. Thanks everyone. So uh, thank you so much, Demetrius. And I want to uh, introduce another keynote speaker who's going to